It is such a pleasure for me to host uh, Stan Greenberg tonight. You you all know he's written this book, which has a phenomenal title, I guess depending on your point of view politically. It's called R.I.P. G.O.P., How the New America is Dooming, Dooming the Republicans. And I just, if you, in case you start flipping to the actual text, make sure you stop on the uh, dedication page because he dedicates the book to the Women's March and the Resistance, uh, which is worth noting. So... I thought that was original and much appreciated by at least people like me. Um, Stan and I uh, crossed paths in my previous incarnation as a speechwriter in the Clinton White House back in the Jurassic period of American politics. Uh, he was then assessing voter moods and preferences and providing p political strategy as Bill Clinton's chief pollster. Now, helping an upstart young governor win the presidency and then becoming one of his chief advisors would be the high water mark for most political professionals. But in Stan's case, it's just one of the many ways in which he's influenced progressive politics and policies over um, a remarkable career. Let me just say that one of his very, very best moves politically and personally was marrying Rosa DeLauro, who's here somewhere. There she is in the back. Um, I hope you all know she is not only a smart and wonderful and uh, great woman, um, she's also one of the most consistently progressive feminist voices in the United States House of Representatives from Connecticut. So great to have you here. And also great to have some other Greenberg family members who are chips off the block when it comes to being active in trying to right the world's wrongs. <laughs> Uh, in addition to working with leading political figures here and overseas and founding Greenberg Research Associates and two progressive organizations, Democracy Corps and Citizen Opinion, Stan also is a prolific author of best-selling books, perhaps the thing we care most about here. Uh, R.I.P. GOP is, I think, your 10th book. Is that right? It's up there. He's, I think he's in double digits. Um, and it really is a must read for anyone who's trying to make sense of the maddening politics of the current moment without, you know, driving themselves off a cliff. Uh, Stan will, will describe in more detail his theory of the case, but in brief, um, it's at the Republican Party beginning several iterations ago, but now, especially under Donald Trump, is increasingly out of touch with the realities of a multicultural multiracial, more secular, more egalitarian, less tradition-bound, and much younger America, what Stan calls the new America, and that in clinging to an old and outdated version of America, Republicans will pay a price in 2020. He'll explain, I think, maybe, um, I hope, that uh, even the victory of a Republican in the special election yesterday in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District is evidence of the new America fighting back against Trump Republicanism. Stan's insights are rooted in the politics of the past several decades, often overlooked in current analyses, and they help him explain which voting groups will be a key to a Democratic victory in the presidential election and beyond. The galvanization of this new America, he says, quote, bloodied the GOP in 2018 and will finally crash it in 2020. Um, now, I'm, uh, because I'm the owner of a bookstore and we do care about, we really do genuinely care about debate and discussion, I will present although you probably know from my past experiences where my politics are. I will present a face of neutrality here, but I will tell you that I was speaking to a good friend today and encouraging him to come to the event, and I told him what the book was about, and he said, just tell Stan from his polling data to God's ears and to the polling booths in 2020. So, Stan, thank you for sharing, uh, for writing the book. Thank you for sharing your conclusions with us and for being here at PNP. It's such a great pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, and um, thank you, uh, Lisa, thank you, Politics and Prose. Um, everybody in this community knows it, but it is, is, it is in fact our neighborhood bookstore here in uh, Union Market, and Members of our family are here. We also have a, a Connecticut uh, branch, and our part of the family are also visit that. And so this is our this is our family bookstore wherever our family lives in the Washington area, and they look to it for to be to know the world and have an expansive view of the world. Um, and let my I should shout out to not just Rosa Deloro who is um, here. Um, uh, Dana Milbank is here, and Anna Greenberg, and Sadie 
Um, and I assume other grandchildren are in the, in the mix, but the, they are what matter. And actually in the, in the, in the acknowledgments, I say this is the first book that wasn't dedicated to my wife or grandchildren. Um, and, the, and I focused on the women's march and the resistance and for reasons that I think you'll see. Um, my wife is, uh, I, dedica I dedicate the book in practice at the end, you'll see, I say this is her moment. She really is in the front lines. She's the one who had to go to the inauguration uh, at the election of uh, uh, President Trump. I skipped that uh, day, um, but she did. But she is, she's the one who carries on those fights. Um, and I do find that in almost every interview, uh, the interviewer will say, well, Stan Greenberg is married to the most fabulous member of Congress, Rosa DeLauro. Sometimes they do that on air, sometimes not, but that's, I'm stuck with it. Uh, the, um, I do want to thank Thomas Dunn, my publisher. Um, Tom copyrighted the title, uh, Rip GOP, Rest in Peace uh, GOP. Now, if you, if you look at the book, the book that has the long list of books that I've written, um, the 10 books. Near the bottom of that, uh, you'll see one book that's named Race and State in Capitalist Development, A Comparative Perspective. Now, there is a cult following um, for that book, <laughs> but it does not shout out end apartheid now. <laughs> but it might have. Had I, had I talked to Tom, I, it might have been different. What I've, what, what I've discovered with this title is that if I leave the jacket, um, at a table, at a cafe, or if, uh, or if my desk were working on, or the, uh, the, uh, cellar, um, if, I, if people will come with abandon and come up to me and say, is it true? Are you sure? I hope you're right. At the, at the last hotel of our vacation, at breakfast, someone came up, a man came up at breakfast and walked up, ignored Rosa as if she was not there for the first time in our lives, and said, have you finished it? You know, is it really true? So I have started carrying my book in a newspaper <laughs> in, order to, in, order to be, uh, in order to be protected. And so it's been a long, it's a long way from race and state and capitalist development. Um, I want to thank C-SPAN uh, as here, uh, Book Notes um, is, is filming, and they'll be filming uh, my remarks and also your questions and answers as we talk about the book. Now, I wrote this book, as I wrote in the introduction, because I had to. You know, after Trump's election, um, I hurriedly, hurriedly, you know, wrote uh, pieces, op-ed pieces in The Guardian, The New York Times, Democracy Journal, Democratic Strategist, most of all, The American Prospect. The Washington Post had run a number of my uh, piece, my thinking before the election. Um, I, I attended every seminar that Mike Pothauser organized at the AFL trying to understand what had happened in the election. Um, but it really was the Women's March, joining the Women's March, and what happened that day uh, which was electric, intense, um, and said immense things, which also turned out to be true. Um, and what I what I wrote in the in the acknowledgments is when I woke up the day, when I woke up the next day, and, and every day, I asked myself, what have I done today to resist and make sure Donald Trump is repudiated? I couldn't sleep most nights, and as it turns out, many millions more were reacting in the same way. They got involved, gave money, attended marches, descended on town halls, rushed to airports to protect Muslim refugees. I decided to write a book because of the resistance, most of, most of whom were painfully uncertain how this would all turn out. I wrote it because of the opposite. I believe Donald Trump's victory was the last desperate battle of a Tea Party-dominated Republican Party to stop an unstoppable new America from governing, and they would fail. Indeed, Trump getting the nomination confirmed the story. Trump winning the election accelerated the defeat of his party, whose battle against modernity 
or have it shattered. Trump governing would make the great majority of the country newly conscious of their own values, beliefs, and priorities. People thought I was smoking. <laughs> um, I hope you, uh, you, I hope you, you know I'm right. Nobody would believe me until the country was swept by a blue wave in 2018, but not then either. I couldn't even convince James Carville, my partner, so we'll have to wait until the 2020 blue wave to be truly convinced that when Trump has left, uh, left the office. So when I, when I finished this book and began to think about these kinds of lectures and began to think about what its contribution would be, I asked, what is it that is different about this book than others that, that have, have been written about this period? Because I, I don't just talk about a shattering defeat of the Republicans. I write about the demise of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I don't just talk about the defeat and repudiation of the Republicans. I talk about a new era of activist government. What is that based on? <laughs> it turns out I learned a lot from writing the history, reading and writing the history of the Republican Party, writing about the uh, using uh, social sciences on the findings about public attitudes during that period, uh, and also my own in-depth research with Republicans, who I listened to very closely um, on on why they were what the, why they were doing what they were uh, what they were doing. What I discovered is America really needs to be understood as confronting a whole series of historic junctures, where social movements, protests, political organization, party realignment came out of new major laws or court action that changed our social relationships. They made a whole series of them, civil rights, abortion and contraception, abortion being legal and contraception being legal, immigration expanding. All of the, legis all of the, all of the legislation, the court action as a whole, each time made us freer, more equal, more democratic, junctures where political parties were forced to choose. And what we found was that at each juncture, the Democratic Party, though it was divided, ultimately aligned with those changes, accepted those changes, and that became part of its identity. At each juncture, the Republican Party, with a base in the South, expanded it, expanded Deep South at first, the whole South, eventually into the more Appalachian and rural parts of the country with an evangelical base. Um, with that base, resisted civil rights, resisted abortion and expansion of, and contraception and the sexual revolution, um, and expand and, and resisted immig legal immigration. Hmm. All of which defined the uh, the two parties in very uh, special ways. Let me read from the beginning of the uh, chapter on the, on the history of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is trapped in an ever more desperate counter-revolution against the cumulative and accelerating trends that are producing a new America. It is a party defined and divided by its leaders' unrepentant struggle and against an America that is more and more racially diverse. It is also a battle to slow the growing secularism, the decline of the traditional family, and the growing independence of women and their sexual freedom. It is a fight against a rising immigration and foreign presence. And in its Tea Party and Donald Trump stage, it is a party pitted against the growing millennial generation, the young, and against the growing metropolitan centers where very different values are taken for granted and now defended. The party was shaped through the struggle over civil rights. The book describes in, in a lot of detail, more than I knew, um, how the two parties dealt with civil rights and the, and the, and the role of the equal rights, affirmative action for uh, African Americans. Um, it deals with the, uh, the, uh, the abor abortion rulings um, and the rights to contraception and privacy and how the two parties dealt with that. 
And the book deals with, most importantly, I think, with immigration, uh, which I came to see how central it was and how important Pat Buchanan was to a Republican Party that ultimately produced a Donald Trump. Because he, Pat Buchanan was the economic, was the nationalist, um, and actually out of, out of favor in his own party, but in fact, much more aligned with the growing anti-immigrant trend of the party at the base of the party in California and where we had Prop 27, but also as the party became nationalized, the immigration uh, issue. Um, but it was President Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama, you know, who, uh, who brought all this together. I, I used to think that was a stage in this process, but I actually believe it all came to fruition. The battle over civil rights, the rights of women, immigration, all came together with the election of an African-American president with a coalition, a diverse coalition uh, that, uh, the, of the uh, New America um, that kind of represent, that was trying to expand government, activist government to deal with the deep recession and also the Affordable Care Act and other actions that produced the Tea Party battle wave movement, wave against him, and produced a decade of gridlock and government being blocked from acting to address any problem. But it was rooted in the election of Barack Obama and his re-election, which said that the new America was winning, and the new America, the fact that re-elected an African-American president said that ultimately it would win. But what that produced was an intense battle, you know, against, um, against him. So while the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States was celebrated across the country and the globe, but his election brought to fruition the successive escalating battles of the GOP against civil rights, abortion, and immigration. He embodied the political triumph of the new America and the Democratic Party that controlled all branches of government this activism was resisted by the Tea Party that carried the GOP social mission into battle. They produced an explosive growth of racial and partisan polarization that put a Tea Party-dominated GOP in charge of most of the country for a decade. And most people don't recognize, in fact, that this wasn't just a shellacking, as President Obama talked about, 2010. And we didn't know it at the time. They brought government to a halt. Um, they produced a IMF-like budget austerity on the federal budget. They cut uh, budgets across the states where they had control, which was in most of the states. Um, they cut education spending. Uh, they blocked the government addressing any of the evolving problems. So the government was impotent to address problems of inequality, wage stagnation, the loss of wealth, climate change, assault weapon violence, problem after problem, government was stopped in its track from acting at the national level, at the state level, for a decade. And that has built up, in my view, and, and I think we're watching it in the, in the huge demand for government action. We now see the support for government action at the highest level we have seen in our, you know, in our polling and all of people's polling. So what we've come to I think is a is a is a a Republican Party where Donald Trump emerged through his control of the Tea Party, his dominance of the Tea Party, coalition with ev evangelicals, he expanded it to conservative Catholics that liked his America First populism, and under and in that coalition and in that fight against New America, they've driven away moderate women in particular, they've driven away independents. And they've also driven away secular conservatives uh, who hate the Tea Party dominance of the Republican Party. And now 70% in our current polls, 70% of the Republican Party now are the Tea Party, the Evangelicals, and observant Catholics. So it is a wholly religious party, even more religious than it's ever been, with a Tea Party battle that is particularly focused on uh, fighting government. So what that has produced is a moment where I believe we will see the demise of the Republican Party. And the reason why I focus on the demise of the party, rather than I think just the idea that they are about to lose a, an election in a, in, a, in a blue wave, I think most people are looking at this 
in a linear and static way. When you read the book, you will, you will actually see in, every, in each area that I focus on, every trend is accelerating. Every, every trend is interacting with each other. Every trend is producing a reaction that is multiplying the effects of this Trump battle, Trump Republican battle against the new America. So we're watching in demographic trends. And I, I've updated my, this book from my last book, but if you look at just the growth in percentage foreign born, it's accelerating, it's never been higher than it is right now. There may be Donald Trump in the office, but there's nothing that he can do that can keep this country from being more diverse, more foreign born, more secular, more millennial. Every trend is accelerating. The, but that's, that's produced a reaction amongst the Republicans so that in reaction to those trends, to fight those trends, it's meant that the Tea Party evangelical bloc that is the base for Trump has grown even stronger and driven out the more moderate and uh, secular parts of the Republican Party. So the only thing left is kind of a California type Republican Party that is worried up only about the demographic problem um, and how to keep this new majority from using government to address, to govern on their behalf. And then we have the reaction to, in each area. As, the, as, the, as they have suppressed government from doing anything, addressing any problem, we see a huge growth in the American people wanting to use government for public purposes. And that's reflected in what's uh, in reaction to candidates in the Democratic primaries. We see a growth in support for multiculturalism, but let me end on immigration. Because you would think that this story, he's able to play that card again. In the end, as I wrote in, the, in my New York Times op-ed, people basically think that race has come to matter at so many point, at so many of these junctures, and he has somehow got elected in 16, and we know that race was a significant part of what pr brought him there. But he's been playing immigration since he came in. In 2018, he waged the 2018 election, a high turnout election, not a, you know, not something that was quirky. It was one of the highest turnout elections we've ever had in an off year. He sent 5,000 troops to the border, focused on the caravan coming to America, uh, the uh, hiding terrorists, had ads, uh, with, uh, uh with undocumented immigrants who had uh, killed, you know, police officers. It was all out Bannon war in the 2018 election. They lost in a landslide in 18, but they also lost on that issue. So if you ask, if you ask whether immigration was benefiting or hurting the country, it was by a 20 point margin. People said it benefited the country. The margin was 8.6%. It was double the vote margin. In fact, if you look at his job approval yesterday, his job approval, which was dropping to 38%, but his job approval on handling immigration was lower. So somehow people think, if you only get the immigration thing right, that it'll somehow work, come around for him. The immigration issue is taking him down because the what's happened with his election is that the American people became engaged. We saw it in the resistance, but they've also become more conscious of their values. So we've gone from 50% believing the country benefits from immigration to 65% now. Um, in reaction to what he's doing. Look at what happened in North Carolina where they used immigration to try to you know, drive the election. It was a 10-point swing compared to 2016 in that, in, that, uh, in that seat. Exactly what would happen in the 2018 election elsewhere uh, in the country. Uh, the, it does not work. Immigration hurts it. And the, the challenge, I think, for the Republican Party coming out of this is are they are they the California Republican Party? The California Republican Party battled the demographic pro uh, problem. They lost every off have lost every office, and have only become more extreme. If you look and see who's taken positions in the state legislature in California, 
the, those who led that effort are in the White House, including Steve Miller, are, you know, are part of the Trump White House. How do they, how does the party react to the, to the being beaten despite their focus on the demographic problem and immigration when the country is saying we are a multicultural country? The more you bat, make this battle, the more we, we accept our history and our diversity. I think we have two challenges. A challenge for the Republican Party, what do they do next? I used to think there would be a battle between the socially liberal parts of the Republican Party and the Tea Party Evangelical. But they've driven those segments out. So I don't know what happens, you know, the day after. The question will be, do Democrats look at this moment as well and take advantage of this opportunity? Uh, this is not a moment for bipartisanship. This is a party in disrepute. This is a party that's losing its, uh, losing its, the, the members that would be civil and able to be part of any kind of bipartisan effort. This is a period in which the public is desperate for a government that will address problems. This is a, this is a, a, a period, uh, in which we have a, people want a government that accepts that we're a multicultural country with equality for a whole range of groups. We have a whole range of problems. Um, but if you have a Republican Party that's no, no, no longer relevant, are Democrats up to the scale of the challenge that come with taking on an activist government at this moment? Thank you very much. <laughs> So if you do have questions, um, because the span is here, I do have a microphone, so please raise your hand and I'll get over to you as fast as I can. Thanks very much, Stan and Dana Marshall. It's good to see you again. Congratulations yes. on the yes. uh, book. A couple of questions maybe for you. One mm. is, um, uh, with uh, this, the question, question about the competition for the Democratic Party going forward, we don't want, I don't think, a mm. one-party country what kind of resolution do you see going forward that mm. makes sense for the country as, as a whole? Mm -hmm. And the other one that I think is more of a profound issue, something that's bothering me, I think many of us very much agree with your idea about, first of all, the United States is moving in a multicultural direction, mm. uh, diverse direction. These are positives for the United States. But one thing which I think might help those who are not completely convinced by that is if that we could inject some element of new areas where we can unify the country. Where are the areas of unity? What is it that brings the country together at a time of such great diversity? I think that those elements will be important. I think, I recall President Clinton once said that one of his roles was to try to make change safe. Mm -hmm. This might be a way to help make that kind of very fundamental change seem safer for people that are wondering, who are all these people coming here? What unites us as a country? Mm -hmm. no, well, I think what I think what unites us is a desire for America to be a country in which there is a middle class that can prosper, and that young the next generation can have a future, and this can be a country again that had the had the kind of ambition and kind of unity and patriotism that came when working people of all types were able to prosper. For me, that means not that we have a unity that goes cross party. I think we're, we're at a moment of time, I've, for me this looks like the Whigs, this looks like a, a populist era where you had populist parties that won. It looks like 1932 and 36 when there's a Democratic Party this is a time to govern. We've had a decade of not being able to address a massive rise of inequality, loss of wealth, wage stagnation, climate change, gun violence, massive gun violence, slaughter. We have been impotent. Politics has made us impotent, and we were desperate to address those problems. We actually have are very unified on wanting to address those big problems. And if you look at Democrats, this is the Democrats' time to govern. And if you look at Democrats, they want to address these problems. They're economic, they're cultural, um, and they unify Democrats. If you look at the Democrats, about 75 to 80 percent, almost any issue, 
that you put out on the, on the table, they want us to address. They want their political leaders to address. After they've been blocked from governing, I think, by a Tea Party evangelical revolt to keep them from governing. I think we've been stopped for a decade. Trump has taken it to the most extreme to keep it, us from governing. I actually think it's a moment to be empowered and reform. This is a period for reform. I haven't, I haven't mentioned the corruption that is central. That's the big money that was also al uh, aligned with this. The anger with the, how big business has become, its influence, the, uh, the, the role of big corporate money in politics, all of which have, have made people believe politics that does not work for the average person. So I think this is a reform period. It's a moment for reform, action, disruptive change. I think it's a, it's a moment for that kind of engagement. I stand. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, two questions. Um, the first is um, there's so much sense about Trump mm -hmm. and, and that he should be beatable. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a lot of discussion, as you know, mm -hmm. um, that there are divisions among Democrats, that there's a lot of tensions, and that they could undermine mm -hmm. the ability to win in 20 in the next election. So I'd be interested mm -hmm. in your comment on that. The other thing that I wanted to, you made a really interesting point about religion and how that's playing. Um, mm -hmm. So you have a, a Republican Party that is looking more and more extreme, even right. on the religious side. You have a Democratic Party that... Um, you know, the DNC just adopted a resolution lifting up the unaffiliated mm -hmm. and making clear that that's an important moral voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they are clearly feeling pressure to speak to the non-religious group. Right. I was kind of interested in your comment on, on, mm -hmm. on how the religion... They're more unaffiliated than mainline Protestants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So interested in your mm -hmm. comment. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about the New America and it's... because. Uh, I mean, I have a chapter on how did Democrats let Donald Trump win? Because people are have had had huge struggles. Um, we've had a you know loss of wealth, um, enormous financial strains, um, structural changes, uh, or, you know, issues with costs with health care, you know, child care, housing that make it very hard to get by. People are really at the edge, um, and the. The religious issues are not so much religious issues. For, for most people, it's survival. People are at the edge. They're looking for a government that's on their side. Um, and that's a pretty fundamental change that they are looking for. But the reform, the corruption is a big piece of why they've turned away from Trump. And the, and the, and the, the fact that TARP, the bailout of the banks, but not, but nothing done for people in, with their houses and their mortgages it was kind of a defining moment. Democrats were part of the problem. Democrats were not to seem to get it, to understand how much, how big a struggle it is. And so they are looking for leaders who understand how big a struggle life is, how corrupt politics has been, the need to break the, the nexus of business and politicians that keeps government from working for the average person. These are big issues that have all been bottled up, not to mention climate change and, and issues uh, and gun violence and the opioid crisis. But government has done nothing for a decade, purposely. I mean, this has been a Tea Party dominance and has purposely both disempowered government, but also argued that government is powerless, you know, to address these problems. You know, if you look at the conservative side, why are people you know idle? Because the government incentives you know for idleness you know it's so clueless and small when people are looking for for big big government that is activist and and addressing their problems. So R.I.P. has an idiomatic meaning. <laughs> it's on a tombstone. Mm -hmm. But Irish Catholic girl, Latin scholar here says, rest Gwiaskot in pace, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be peaceful? Are they going to go peaceful? Mm -hmm. That's what worries me. As a grandma, yeah. as a, I'm worried. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I like the concept. <laughs> look, you, 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 look, you raise a, a, a serious issue. There's lots of data. 
and lots of evidence uh, of on the way people are reacting to these trends and to losing power and, and Trump losing power, I think will be symbolic in the same way that Barack Obama being elected and reelected was symbolic. So, uh, you know, we've already seen reactions that are playing out. Um, I'm worried about those reactions. Uh, the, I don't know, there really does need to be a Republican party. People ask the question, there really does need to be a Republican party that is in opposition to the Democrats. But I don't know how you get there given the California experience or how you get there in the short term. If I look at the Democrats, you know, it took us about four national elections before we elected somebody that could win nationally. And I worked for Bill Clinton, but we had a lot of battles, internal battles as a party, um, bitter battles. But I, but I remember when Bill Clinton was running and there were a whole range of unions that were supporting him that had no good reason to support him given where his stand was on, on NAFTA and other, and other issues. And they just said, we've got to win. <laughs> you know, we just, we can't be out of power. We can't be out of power any longer. We, you know, we've got to win. The stakes are too high. What happens with the business coalition of the Republican Party? What happens with Fox News? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, you, look, I think there's going to be a, this election and there probably another election in which the current contours play out. It was easier before when they were divided down the middle between the socially liberal part and the Tea Party evangelical part. Wasn't easy, but they were going to have a battle over, you know, what you know, what their party stood for. It's much harder when you've driven those voters out. And how do you and how do you get them back? You know, you had Perot who went out, and pro voters, I think, ultimately came back to the Republicans or his voters. And so maybe there's, you know, in this process, something that brings them back. The issue is how do they become a relevant party? I mean, you have working, fam you know, you have working families. You still have a party that is fighting contraception. I mean, you can look at the budget, you know, the federal budget next year, and they're still trying to defund sex education. Their suit against the Affordable Care Act was on contraception. Uh, I mean, they have not just accepted the sexual revolution. It's not just abortion. They're obviously going to be a pro-life party. But they have to find a way... They used to they used to have child care policies. They used to have health care policies. They no longer have child care policies because that looks like it privileges work over you know homemakers. I mean they have they have to come to terms with being a modern party and being relevant, which is why you know I've said this is you know, they've been fighting the social modernization of the country. This battle has you know has so made them illegitimate and marginalized. Um, now they've had to fight in, in an extreme, a, a, a way that's become more and more extreme. It's driven away their own voters, independent voters, and has consolidated Democrats determined to vote against them. And so we'll have this election that hopefully sets up a period of governance for reform. But it's gotta, there's gotta be a process on the Republican side. You know, otherwise it will be incentivized, you know, those who seek, you know, non-legitimate Hi, Ron Hi. Pollack. Yes. Uh, I want to build on uh, Ellen's first question about the positioning of Democrats. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it by making a statement, but I'd like you to treat it as a question. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there's, when you listen to the uh, first two debates, mm -hmm. uh, the description of the division between the Democrats is that uh, it's characterized as having resolute progressives, and moderates. Uh, and somehow or other, I, I don't feel comfortable with that description. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was listening to the uh, debates, you know, I was trying to figure out where are the real differences between the candidates. And take health care, which uh, obviously I care deeply about, and, um, and which was a top issue in both of the debates. Uh, if you think about the spectrum of Democrats, mm -hmm. all of them care about achieving universal coverage. Maybe different methodology, mm -hmm. but they all care mm -hmm. about universal coverage. 
They all care about getting the costs down. And so I'm just wondering, in terms of the positioning of the Democrats, whether the current theme uh, that has been developing about residents, mm. um, progressives, mm. and moderates, how well or how poorly mm. that serves the Democratic Party in terms of positioning mm. for the upcoming election. Mm. You know, I've been unco- you know I've been uncomfortable with it, and if you read the New York Times op-ed that I wrote, you know it be- it begins with my discomfort with the commentators who are talking about them driving away the moderate moderate voters with their over the top you know plans for government, um, or driving away independents who are looking for bipartisanship. So I'm I'm conscious of that. I I actually think that there's much broader unity in the way you're talking about. I mean, if you stretch from what Biden proposed, uh, you know, Senator Harris proposed, uh, Warren Sanders, they're all very big new government, use, government playing a much, much bigger role in health care, um, bigger than Obamacare, I mean, by a lot. It, this is a new stage government playing a much bigger role. I think the debate will refine where Democrats go. I'm not worried about it. Um, there's a survey that was conducted by, I think it's called Morning um, Consult. I think it's being released tomorrow, and I was interviewed about it, and I, I, you know, I read the results um, today. And it asked this interesting question, not whether you're liberal, moderate, conservative. Uh, it asked... Whether the Democratic Party is social democratic, whether it's conservative, whether it's liberal, whether it's moderate. Okay. So only about, about a quarter said it was conservative, only about 20% said social democratic. But about 60% said it's liberal, and 60% said it was moderate. So you had people are looking at the Democratic Party and looking at the presidential process and what they're concluding is that we're both liberal and moderate. They don't, they don't, they, I think they're saying what you're saying and what I think I'm saying is that this distinction is a, is a commentator distinction. It's not a voter distinction. It's certainly not a, a distinction amongst Democrats because I think that the, and this is a survey of Democrats, I think they view our party as both liberal and moderate and they're comfortable with it. And I think well, our candidates will find a way of getting to a bold posture because that's where their starting point is. It's bold in almost every area. Thanks for your mm. talk. Um, mm. It was quite inspirational. I'm, I'm the mm. vice chair of my county Democratic Party mm-hmm. in a pretty conservative town, a county in Ohio. Um, so I'd like to get like the title of your book tattooed across my chest. <laughs> so t-shirts, for, I'm sure. For, for t-shirts are coming. Mm. Um, but I wonder how you would react to one of my great concerns um, going into the 2020 election, which is voter suppression efforts mm. and other sort of political machination, mm. like we saw in North Carolina mm. ninth or the Georgia mm. lieutenant governor's race, and mm. how much Democrats are going to have to win by more than they really should have to win. For sure. I mean, I, I look. There's no doubt we won. Georgia and Florida in 2018. I mean, we take we kind of take that for granted <laughs> that the that that happened as part of our wave discussion. But just think what that discussion would have looked like if, in fact, we, African American candidates had won, had become governor uh, in those two states, um, and uh, held the senator's position as well. But the there's no doubt that voter suppression was prominent. We've gained more control of state government, and so there's there's less room for it, but there isn't any doubt. Um, the stakes are so high um, that voter suppression is going to be carried you know, forward, uh, I'm sure, in Florida um, and Georgia um, at a great rate, maybe Texas. Um, though, you know, the stakes are very high, and so we do, we will have to win by a much bigger margin. If you look at the the margin in, in the 2018 election, it was 8. 6%. But we're, we're looking at about a 10-point spread when you look at who's voting, who says they're going to vote in the Democratic primaries and Republican primaries. It's like 47%, 37%. If you look at the gap on approval, disapproval of Trump, you're looking at over 10, you know, over, you know, over 10 points. Um, so I think we have to push to that scale. 
uh, the I do think you know there will be some price in our candidates and whether they and whether they you know appeal broadly and you know and deeply, and the Senate it is you know is critical that we win the Senate. This would be a tragic election if we came out of it with Mitch McConnell still in control you know of the Senate. Uh, right now, if you look at the different presidential candidates, you basically have Biden you know about you know ten. 12 points ahead of Trump. Um, you have other candidates ahead by eight. Warren, you know, seven, I think, a recent poll and on, on average. Now, that's bigger. That's a bigger lead than Obama had in 2008. But it's not the, it's, but it's not the biggest possible. Now, maybe she grows in her, posi in her position. She's clearly grown in support over time. But we've reached a point where Democrats are so consolidated and intense that it may be that almost any candidate, you know, starts with a seven point margin and up. But do we need the bigger to overcome what's happening to, you know, bar legitimate voting, um, to make sure we win the Senate? So we have time for another one or two questions. Uh, something you just said, uh, triggered a question, which is, how important are independents going to be in 2020? Uh, it sometimes seems to me that in elections, mm -hmm. Democrats focus so much on getting mm -hmm. independents that they don't focus enough yeah. on getting mm -hmm. the base. So how important is that going yeah. to be? Um, I be? I've become a base person <laughs> because, uh, the, uh, the, because I, be I believe in that's how, that's how Trump won, and, that, and I think that's how Hillary did not win. When you read my book, you'll see, you know, you'll read the frustrating emails going back and forth uh, with Robbie, with John Podesta and Robbie Mook uh, in the Hillary Clinton campaign on the fact that Sanders voters were not consolidated and trying to get them to pay attention to them, you know, at the end. 45% of Democrats voted, you know, for Sanders coming into that, you know, and, and recalling that they voted that. And, you know, we were, I think, losing 15%. They're very liberal voters, and we were losing 15% of them. And we did. And they did decline to try to consolidate those voters. And so I, I believe that what's happened in 18 was a consolidation of Democrats and high turnout. The Democratic base, including the independents, is at a 48%. Right now in our polls, we're winning over 90% of those voters. Those voters are, are if you ask whether they have disapprove of Trump, it's that 87% of Democrats disapprove of Trump. It's like 67% of Republicans strongly approve. So our voters are much more engaged, much more anti-Trump, I very consolidated, and I think it's the reason why almost every Democrat is doing well. Now, you do have 10% who are independents. Now, but I, th I think the starting point is, you know, is a, a base that believes in its candidate, believes that, that train just, change is coming. And I think our candidates are, you know, getting that now increasingly. Uh, when you look at independence, the Trump, the margin for Trump on his approval is, is minus 15 in our polls. Biden was winning them by 10. Uh, Warren was winning them by five. So we were winning independence. But it varied by, you know, by candidate, and it wasn't at the highest level possible given where, how they view Trump. So there was still room to make gains with independence, but there's a bigger gain that comes with consolidating the 48% of the electorate that's there and, and they're being intensely involved. Also, there is a level of engagement we've never seen before. We, we ask a question, it's a one to 10 scale, 10 being I'm following politics extremely closely. Now, it always goes up at the, at the end of the election, October, November, then it drops sharply, and then goes up month by month until you get to the end of the election, and hits its high point, and then drops again. All right. In 2018, in the off-year election, the, our, that number in our polling was higher than the presidential level in 16. So people were following politics more closely at the end of the 18 election than they had in the presidential election. So it was a presidential level engagement. 
We have now done two polls in January and July. The number's gone up 10 points. It didn't go down. In every election we've ever done, the number drops after the last election. The number today is higher than it was in 18 when it produced a historic turnout, the highest turnout we've ever seen. So, so groups we work with are now going out early and talking to unregistered voters and seeing, are they really engaged? And we have found women in particular are, are following very closely. Trump motivates and engages them. He's in their face every day and is impacting the election in ways we've never seen before. So I think there's going to be a expanded electorate beyond anything we've seen before, you know, affecting this. Um, this is driven by hostility to Trump and driven also by the belief that finally there's going to be uh, critical change. I think it's heavily driven by the base. But we're winning independence, just a question of how, by what margin. Um, you had mentioned what happens in 2020 if the Republicans still hold the Senate. If that does occur, what does that do for the death of the Republican Party? <laughs> well, if I mean, look, if the we're we're watching a trend that's not changing at state level. I mean, we we watch major you know major changes that you know happened are getting back governorships, control of Secretary of States, huge number of legislative seats. That's going to conti uh, continue. We're going to get new reapportionment. So the trend at state level and at the executive level will uh, continue, particularly if we elect the president, which I presume will happen. And obviously, there's a lot of room for executive use of executive power. If you are blocked again, hopefully we're not doing that. Uh, but if you're blocked again. But I think it'll be incredibly dispiriting for our own people. <laughs> I'm not sure about the Republican Party. You know, what would have happened if Hillary had won and been blocked in doing anything uh, as president? Would we have gotten slaughtered in the last elections? They controlled reapportionment. It would have been painful um, going forward. Um, but our people will be very dispirited. We end up being blocked from being able to pass any legislation. If you can't raise taxes, you can't raise revenue in fundamental ways. You can't address, you know, the problems. You know, I saw in, in, in Bloomberg that a description of what would happen to the wealth of the, of the, of the, of the, of the richest, um, globally of billionaires. And it was like cut to about a third of what it was. And, uh, and they looked at it and said, you know, be warned. I looked at it and said, well, isn't that reasonable? <laughs> that not just to cut the wealth, but obviously to use those funds to do important things. But, I think being uh, us being innovative, able to use government, depends on revenue and, and acting in, in bold ways. It's very hard to do it unless you have the Senate. I think we'll be affected in some ways more than Republicans. They still don't have a way out. You know, they're just they're in some ways they're left just blocking. You know, maybe there'll be some you know new segment that wants to be bipartisan coming out of that, but I don't. I doubt. I, I think the Trump faction will be even more dominant after the election. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, have the honors of the last question, unless somebody else uh, hasn't had a chance. But mm. first of all, thank you again for coming and Stan. I just I have mm. sort of a a polling question because I wish you were <laughs> at the breakfast table every morning to interpret <laughs> all these polls that keep coming out, but mm. you're not. So we all have to sort of decide mm. what we think of them and try to mm. interpret them. And I know a lot of people who just say, oh, you know, the polls were always wrong in the previous elections. We can't trust them. Mm -hmm. They don't mean anything. So can you just give us a quick little uh, primer on how to read polls mm -hmm. now, which ones to pay attention to, which ones do mm -hmm. matter, which don't, and whether we should believe any but yours? <laughs> okay, it's a um, good question and one I get all the time. <laughs> Um, but it's still a good question. The first of all, the national polling was not that far off in terms of where you know the uh, margin, uh, but the state polls are very uneven uh, in their quality, uh, and you frequently go through long periods with no po you know no polls at the, you know at the state level, and so that you know that's where it got it wrong, very wrong. 
Uh, but the but it was also related to failing to represent enough working class voters in those polls. You know, if you believe the exit polls, they had a much larger educated portion of the electorate. It turns out the exit polls are wrong. Most of us as polls would average, we weren't sure. So we averaged between the census and the exit polls on the on education. But after the 2016 election, we just went with the census, which gives you a working class population that's about 63% of registered voters. Um, so people need to keep in their mind that there's such a large portion of the country is working class. Um, and, and they played a disproportionate role in, in, in 16. Uh, and there's no reason to think that they won't as well in, uh, in the elections going forward. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, can we get one more round of applause for this thank conversation you. tonight?